remember, remember the 5th of November. Are those lines familiar to you? Just one second, I'm finishing up your portrait here. And because you are hiding behind that camera, it's going to be a little hard. I'm taking my best stab at it, though. And, alright, what do you think? <laughs> that is a picture of Guy Fox. Now you Brits know him very well as the man who was caught guarding a bunch of powder cakes under the House of Lords on November 5th, 1605, over four hundred years ago. In short, he was trying to blow up Parliament with everybody in it when it would be as packed with the king and um, the gentry. Politicians? Were they called that back then? I don't know. Lawrence. Um, they wanted Parliament to be full, have the king in there, because they were trying to overthrow, they were trying to dismantle the government. Because it was a fundamentally a religious coup. So 1517, alright, so this is 1605, only about 90 years before that, Martin Luther had published his 95 Theses, which led to a division of Western Christianity into different confessions, Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, Anabaptist, Unitarian. At, at its heart, Guy Fawkes was a Catholic, and the what's called the Gunpowder Plot was a, an attempt to overthrow the Protestant, the Anglican, the Puritan, even, dominion over England and help Catholics, which were, um, of course, dominating Spain at that time, help them reestablish the long-lasting rule over all of Europe in the Western Hemisphere. And this plot was foiled by a by a fatal mistake of trying to save the lives of a few of the members of Parliament who were sympathetic to the Catholics. And, um, well, we're going to get into that, but the plot was ultimately foiled. It was literally going to blow up an entire building, the House of Parliament, um, House of Lords, I guess, Parliament. And it would have left a huge power vacuum in which... I think they were trying to ultimately put in a puppet leader who would have been ruled directly by the Pope. So this is an interesting history, and um, you guys of course know it, uh, know about this bad boy from V for Vendetta, and if not, you definitely know about the, the hacktivist, hacker activist group Anonymous. Who of course love to use the Guy Fox mask. Um, a group of online anonymous hackers who I think initially started on 4chan started at least forming a, a, a loose group. But tonight we're talking about Guy Fox, the man behind the mask, the man of the mask. And, um, yeah, what really went down, and a little bit about how it's been perceived in the last 400 years. And, uh, and I'm gonna sound like I got Tourette's here, but I gotta, I wanna thank, I wanna thank fuck all hell <laughs> for, for, um, being generous in your support and um, suggesting this 
video topic. It's actually something I didn't know about, and I'm slowly learning more, more history. It's all, I guess what I'm saying is that it's all fresh. It's all very new to me. And so it's cool when I, when I look at a, when you focus on one topic in particular, you start finding out how they're interrelated. And that's where that whole idea of why I like history comes into play. It's, it's a, it turns into a narrative, you know, you get to see how the puzzle pieces fit together. And the puzzle piece of Guy Fox fits into the history of England in the division between religions, sects of religions, being the Catholics and the Protestants. You know, for centuries, for a millennium, I would say, Catholic Church had a dominion over Europe. Essentially, the Pope, the Pope was like the King of Kings. He was the direct mediator between mortals and God. And all kings had their allegiance to him, you know. He was essentially an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And then as time went on, and scholars dissented from the, um, well, the, the abuse of power that became rampant in the Catholic Church, um, charging indulgences to get into heaven. So we had guys like Luther who were pointing out the corruption, which is kind of innate to large-scale, any large-scale institution. If it gets big enough, it's inevitable. So the the story that's slowly forming in my head, to me, the more I'm learning about all this, it's fundamentally a religious issue. All these wars between the states and nations, groups of nations. You know, so I actually am finding out that most of the stuff that goes down in history is fundamentally religious. It's one group fighting for the ultimate values. What to value? What to value most? And I think a lot of it could be solved if people actually took the time to think more clearly about what it is they believe. I think most of history was just a lot of people being led and being okay with not doing the heavy thinking, the heavy lifting, and in in bearing the burden of responsibility for ironing out and articulating their own idea of what faith should mean to them. In this series, I'm going to um, be referencing this book here. This is... This book here is, I actually uh, was able to use my Story of Civilization books. And this one here is, it's titled The Age of Reason Begins because it's the point at which we, we, uh, our ancestors in Europe at least, those of you who, to whom that applies, began to actually, well, there was a series of inventions, and the overall wealth and standard of living increased to a point at which survival wasn't the wasn't the only thing on our minds. We were able to expand and elaborate on our culture, art, philosophy, theology, and um, it turns out that when we have leisure time and we're able to actually think for ourselves we find that uh, paying Catholic bishops indulgences to get into heaven, or to be li more likely to get into heaven at that, um, doesn't seem like a reasonable idea. And so you have guys like Luther in 1517, really only a, less than 100 years before this gunpowder plot by uh, Guy Fox and... and uh, Catesby um, was devised, symbolic of people 
beginning to think for themselves. So it's called The Age of Reason Begins. But it's not insignificant that probably one of the thickest volumes in this 11-part series was dedicated to reforming and how the church was reformed from beginning from around 1300, which is when many of the modern universities were developed, or not many, but it's when they were established at least. So it's a trend. It's useful to remember what, what has happened in history and to see the big picture. So let's find out what this guy did and what he meant to history. It's 400 years ago and we're still, he's still very much a part of our, you know, especially after being revived by V for Vendetta and the anonymous groups, um, his position, his pers the way we perceive him has actually been flipped, I think, to be a good thing to overthrow what he thought was a tyranny, but you have to look at all the facts. So let's find out why this guy was so, why him and his cohorts conspired to overthrow one religious regime with another and replace it immediately with an older, more traditional, larger um, scheme. Do you know why? Why he was ready to kill his king for for the Pope, essentially. So what actually was the gunpowder plot? In late October 1605, an English nobleman, Lord Monteagle, received a mysterious letter. Along with the rest of England's peers and king, and the king, Monteagle intended to attend the opening of Parliament a few days later. The unsigned letter got straight to the point. It said, My lord, out of the love I bear to you and some of your friends, being Catholic um, apologists, I have a care of your preservation. Therefore, I advise you and your tender, no, as you tender your life, to devise some excuse to shift your attendance on that day. And it ends with, uh, For though there be no appearance of any stir, yet I say they shall receive a terrible blow. Just kind of frightening how he uh, included a pun in there about blowing up an entire building filled with people. The mysterious sender urged Monteagle to burn the letter, of course, after reading, but Montegal decided against it, even though he was a Catholic, or um, given the fact that he was a Catholic. And he actually saved himself gruesome punishment. And because at that time, we're going to get to it later, the punishment for treason was to be disemboweled, have your fingers cut off, to be dragged through the road, and all that before you were either hanged or had your head cut off in public, by the way. Um, so, this guy, you know, doing this and being captured was, it wasn't any in inconsequential, this guy was committed, he was, he was committed, as anybody you might think would be committed today to, uh, some religious dogma, you might say. So what would happen to this guy? So Monteagle forwarded it, forwarded the message to the king's right-hand man, Robert Cecil, essentially. Um, and the king at this time was James I. I was going to go into the long history, but I just don't have time to right now. James I, he was originally king of Scotland, and the famous Tudors that you know from, well, from history, I guess. The lineage of the Tudors, all the way from Henry VIII to Elizabeth I, I guess. Elizabeth was the last in the line of the Tudors, and once she died, there was a vacancy open, because she had, she was known as the Virgin Queen, didn't have any children, so Elizabeth was the last of the 
the line of Tudors. And her older sister Mary, which was the, uh, they're both the daughters of Henry VIII. There's a long history about that, but um, Henry VIII brought in Protestantism. He was, he was down with that. He was down with saying, no, I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to be like one of my subjects and chip off a little fat off the top for the Pope, the fat Pope sitting high and mighty on his throne in Rome. The king wanted to be sovereign. The island of England and France and, um, well, at least France, I think Denmark too, was undergoing this transformation from uh, trying to get out from under the yoke of the grasp of the Catholics at this time in the 1500s. So, yeah, Henry VIII was, he was, he actually started, he instantiated the Protestant, which just means anti-Catholic. It means not Catholic, not anti, but it just means that, uh, no, we're not Catholic. We're our own thing. We're protesting the dogma, which means the the claim to the true interpretation of the Bible. So, the Bible is, it can't be denied that the Bible is metaphorical, you know, and for one person to come and say, well, this is how this metaphor is intended to be perceived. Well, that's what the Catholics did. The Catholics wanted to well, they, they still do, I guess, all church sex do in a way, which might be in the first step in the evolution of where religion's heading, by the way, so just as a side note, it might be ultimately a tipping point where enough individuals educate themselves enough, and not just educate, but actually actualize themselves in the world, and um, become will recognize the true nature of the fact that we're all divine, we're all the most complex things in the universe. I always say that, but it's so true. And so, at some point, we're going to be able to make our own judgments as to what, what we need to gather from history and tradition, what we need, and what we can dismiss in the sense of I don't need someone to be a mediator between me and God if I have developed myself in Jung's terms become if I've individuated myself enough to be able to determine to determine my own destiny and relationship with whatever I define God as so I think I think all of history is slowly the emergence the realization that we that we are part of the universe, which is something most people don't realize, that you're, you're not this thing that studies the universe and learns about it, you are the universe. It's crazy to think about. And I think a select few people throughout history have discovered that. To get back on the topic, these guys, they didn't want to kill innocent people, but the allies, it turned out, didn't want to risk their own neck in being involved in a conspiracy to kill the king under which they they were serving at the time. So, so Robert Cecil got this, and Mr. Monteagle avoided the gruesome punishments that were that were standard practice for treason at the time. And once Robert Cecil got this, he sent it to King James, who I think I was, okay, that's where I deviated, going back into uh, Henry VIII. So, Henry VIII was a Protestant, he claimed himself, um, and it does seem blasphemous, I guess, or heretical, to claim yourself to supplant the Pope's position as the mediator between God and the people. Um, Henry VIII had a couple kids. One ruled, uh, the boy ruled until he died. I, I think that was Edward. And then there was Mary. And she actually reverted back to Catholicism. You know, I don't know if it was because she was 
coerced or not, but when she died, her younger sister, the the daughter of um, Anne Boleyn, I think, was Elizabeth, and Elizabeth actually went back to Protestantism, which literally means they're protesting um, the rule of the Holy Roman Empire. So I think the biggest point to be learned in, in this whole era, this whole context here, is that the English Protestants and the Catholics were mortal enemies, literally, quite literally. There was, um, there was a massacre, too. I gotta bring that up. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, so 33 years before this. So it's like, you know, us in relation to the early 90s. This massacre was a targeted group of assassinations and a wave of Catholic mob violence directed against the Huguenots, which were French, French Protestants. England and France, of course, being right next to each other, they... It was very, very much present in their mind that um, Catholics were a wave of Catholic mob violence. Yeah, so I guess Catholics were the instigators in this one. But I'm sure there's a very complex history behind that as well. But nonetheless, the English, uh, upon discovery of this conspiracy to blow up Parliament, many English Protestants suspected that members of the Catholic minority were plotting to topple the monarchy and impose a Catholic regime with foreign funding and aid. And this message seemed to confirm their suspicions. So the letter made its way to King James. He doubted it at first, but then uh, Earl of Suffolk conducted a search of the Palace of Westminster, where England's Parliament was due to meet the next day. But he did notice a privately rented ground floor storeroom that contained an unusually large amount of firewood. So later that day, Sir Thomas Knivet, a minor but trustworthy royal official, oversaw a second search, and there, and there he found Guy Fox. The same storeroom attracted his attention as did the man Nivet found guarding it. He was not dressed like a watchman, instead he was wearing a cloak, boots, and spurs. Clothes more suited, it seemed, for a quick getaway. Nivet's men shifted the firewood around that they had found in the room and found 36 barrels of gunpowder. Barrels, like casks. The man who gave his name as John Johnson, believably enough, was found to have matches in his person, on his person. Nivet had uncovered an astonishing conspiracy to blow the members of the House of Parliament up. The king, most of the royal family, and the leading officers of the state. The aim was to set up a Roman Catholic regime in Protestant England with James I's daughter, Elizabeth, who would not be in attendance as its puppet ruler. Arrested and tortured, John Johnson, revealed that, like, you couldn't come up with a more convincing name, revealed that he was from Yorkshire in Northern England, and that his real name was Guy Fox. He was one of several Catholic conspirators in what became known as the Gunpowder Plot. While not the ringleader himself, Fox became the best known member of the most famous conspiracy in English history. His capture had been illustrated in countless school books, novels, popular works of history, and movies. A tall, bearded figure in boots, dark cloak, and dark, wide-brimmed hat. It is his figure that is still burned in effigy every year on November 5th. It's ultimately fundamentally a religious thing. It's like, do you want the king of this island to be directly connected with God? Or do you want the king of the entire continent of Europe, called the Pope, to be directly in connection with God? Like, God is the highest power. He's the ultimate person you bow to. 
the final arbiter of good and evil on earth. I think people were very upset that the tradition of Catholicism was broken by Luther and the Protestants, and I think they they feared a tyranny by the kings if they allowed the kings to remain the heads, the highest religious leader. I think there were probably many bishops, many clerical personnel that were probably pretty upset. Usually the separation of church and state, um, well, it had been a long debate since the Middle Ages, actually. So the history of this isn't just, you know, um, Luther wrote up the 95 Theses, and a couple kings decided to run away with that and claim sovereignty over the land and spiritual nature of their kingdom. It was more like this was an idea that the, the Pope had been disputed. His authority as the single, the Godhead, if you will, I hope you will, on earth had been disputed because the Pope, let's be honest, the Pope's only a man, as spiritual as he might be, as in touch with his inner self as he might be, he's still only a man. And actually, I just found this out. I just found out that the Pope is actually only another bishop. It's just in the Western Hemisphere. You have Rome in the West, and then the center of... Um, you have Constantinople, which is like Turkey, Istanbul, is actually the... Uh, I think the, the center of... of Christianity in the East. Pope versus bishops. I can't find it. But there's a really good channel out there who who does history of Christianity. Very interesting snippets. But the Pope, it's unique to Western Christianity that the Pope is is revered above, he's the, he's the bishop of bishops, whereas in the east, they believe that there is no pope, there is only bishops, and those bishops convene to decide what Catholicism as a whole should, um, should act out, and should believe in, and, and should hold as its core tenets, so it's very, very interesting that there's refutation of the Pope's authority, even in the church. It's been, yeah, ever since the East-West Schism of 1054. So, so this wasn't, um, you know, the church has been split a few times. There's been a lot of schisms because ultimately Christianity is, is it comes down to the fact that Jesus was so in touch with himself that he claimed to be in direct communication with God. He, in fact, he claimed to be the Son of God. And he claimed to speak on God's behalf. I think there's so much truth in, in spirituality that we couldn't help but carry on the message of Jesus. He was so confident that he understood the truth of being and his own reality, and his own nature, his own spirit, his own personality, his own soul, I guess, that he was willing to die for what he believed in. But this schism happened because we don't know how to necessarily interpret finally, in a final sense, this, this profound but also metaphorical book about how to orient ourselves in the world, in which direction to to lead entire nations. So this instance of Protestantism and the kings developing their own Anglican church in England, the Church of England, and claiming themselves as the head of the Church of England, which actually is apparently what Queen, Queen Elizabeth even now, today, it's it's still uh, a contemporary tradition. And, 
Apparently Guy Fox and his buddies felt that creating a new church was divisive and Europe should be a whole thing under the Pope. Yeah, he was willing to get killed and tortured, I guess. But if not, he was willing to blow up a bunch of people. So, the political and religious instability of the times unleashed, the Ref unleashed by the Reformation had resulted in the pitting of Catholics against Protestants throughout Europe. In England, religious strife resulted in the accession of Elizabeth I in 1558, and the following year she and her advisors created a religious settlement which envisaged a Protestant national church. The monarch was at its head, although it retained bishops along with the traditional church courts and some pre-Reformation ceremonial practices. Many English Catholics refused to accept this, though, in this period, it was generally accepted in Europe that all subjects of a state should adhere to its official form of Christianity. To achieve the religious uniformity, the Elizabethan regime forbade Catholic worship, including performance of baptisms, marriages, and funerals. Being a practicing Catholic was punishable by law, fines which could be very heavy for habitual habitual Catholic offenders, and even those f refusing to attend England English church services. So all men taking administrative office, from members of parliament to school teachers, had to swear an oath denying the power of the Pope in recognizing Elizabeth as the head of the church. Elsewhere, England was involved in constant warfare in Ireland, which was populated by Catholics. English statesmen feared Spanish intervention on behalf of England's Catholics, while conversely English Catholics looked to Spain for armed support. English Protestant propaganda stressed atrocities committed in the name of Catholicism. The English population was also constantly reminded of the more than 280 people burned in five years by Elizabeth's Catholic predecessor, Mary I. In the 1570 papal bull, which had declared Elizabeth illegitimate and encouraged her subjects to rebel against her. By the close of the 16th century, the Spanish Armada, dispatched in 1588 by Philip II of Spain, but defeated by Elizabeth, was still a fresh memory, along with its mission to reimpose Catholicism in England. So you had Spain just sitting just south of, of England there, and I guess for you guys it'd be like this. And they were they were fully Catholic, so they were out there. You know, this was Spain's heyday. They had just set Columbus to uh, a century before, I guess, to discover. America, or the New World at least, um, they were fully Catholic, so they were very, very close with the Pope, and the Pope was still trying to reach his greedy hands all over Europe. He didn't want sovereign nations. He wanted a unified thing, um, which worked good in his favor. It would make him more powerful, no doubt. Lots of money coming in. That's revenue um, that, uh, that he didn't want to miss out on, you know? People claiming sovereignty and claiming Protestant church authority would uh, really affect his bottom line. So, you know, he ultimately, St. Peter's, St. Peter's Basilica, is it? I mean, he wanted to just coat that thing in gold, essentially. And I have a, you know, I mean, it's hard to pick a good and a bad guy, but obviously it wasn't like Guy Fox was protesting in the way that it, he, um, V in the movie V for Vendetta was portrayed as clearly good and clearly a, um, a victim of a very oppressive Orwell-esque governmental invasive, intrusive authority. 
this was the context of, you know, context of being burned at the stake and torturing, um, being the norm for punishments like treason. This was in the context of continual ebbs and flows of land grabs among all Europe and England as well, and the 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 budding philosophies and theologies of new ways to interpret religion. You know, if I want to worship God, I don't want to have to go to Mass. I don't want to have to pay indulgences to get into heaven. I don't want to have to worship the Pope as though he's God on earth. Um, and that's where the Puritans popped up. They believed that they wanted it to just be a pure connection with God. Then you have the Unitarians, which didn't believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost Trinity. They believed it was all unified. It was all one. It's wrong. There's all these ways of interpreting these deep, deep bedrock foundation beliefs that most people, even today, I, I, I've looked into it, and I still have no idea, like, the depths of these arguments. Um... They get into such subtleties. There's so many little subtle nuance interpretations of the Bible. And people die for this. And it's... I mean, it's no wonder. There's, it's, it's the most important thing that we have going for us. You know, we have an idea that we are divine. And we are the most complex, most fully conscious things that we are aware of. So of course we think we're divine. And we are literally, the more we figure out about science and subatomic physics and cosmology, we are literally a way, we're made up of, we're made up of atoms that are forged in the hearts of stars and blown into far corners of a galaxy that coalesce into star systems and then are rebirthed and planets and then over four billion years we uh, we've come into existence as human beings so this is a crazy time to be alive I mean we think our time is very chaotic it's always been like this there's never been a time in peace where there's nothing to be done it's always these entities in relation to these other entities that own land and want to exert power, and, you know, for the most part, most people have just been fighting for survival, and now, in just the last three or four hundred years, enough of the population has been wealthy enough to be able to actually think, and learn, and educate themselves, and find out what it is that's taken place in history, and that's what we're doing today, I guess, and, you know, this... It, it's so compelling to believe that, um, to, to see this and, and not, it, it's hard not to believe that this is a, uh, it's a really long, slow realization that we're, that we all are, uh, the individual sovereignty is paramount. So it's pretty, it's pretty chaotic all around the Western Europe with Spain, Spain, France, England. Um, essentially, a religious, spiritual, civil war constantly going on. Spain is mostly Catholic. France is figuring themselves out. England at this point although it's fluctuated quite a bit, is mostly Protestant. So, Elizabeth I, so when Henry VIII, one of his sons, I think it was Edward, uh, then one of his daughters, Mary, and then one of his other daughters, Elizabeth, they were the line of Tudors, T-U-D-O-R. And after Elizabeth died, she was a virgin, she didn't have a kid, so they were the last of the line of Tudors, who were very who made a name for themselves for being very heavy-handed. They were 
effective. They weren't passive and they weren't able to be walked over. Um, and then comes in this this new guy from Scotland. He was known up there as James the Sixth, and actually Elizabeth, interestingly, interestingly enough, killed James's mother. Had didn't directly kill her, but had her killed. But nonetheless, he was raised Protestant, so he wanted he wanted to continue the the thread of Protestantism in England. So the son of Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots, James was Protestant. But English Catholics were hopeful that he would be more sympathetic to them because he was actually very learned, um, a bit a bit austin a bit showy in his scholarship. And here to put it into perspective, this book here actually has a part about the gunpowder plots right here. Above the economic and political strife, but deeply, deeply rooted in it, the religious warfare raged. Half the pamphlets that bruised the air were blasts of Puritans against Anglicans, um, Anglican bishops in ritual, and the Anglicans, so the Puritans wanted to get rid of the, what do you call it? The infrastructure of religion. They wanted it to be more personal. Instead of like, you have to go to a church or you have to, um, you have to bow in deference to these people who proclaim to be more religious and more in touch with God than you were. They didn't want any intermediary. They wanted it to be a pure relationship between you and God. So Puritans were against the Anglican bishops and the rituals that went along with it. And Anglicans were against Puritans, um, their rigor and intransigence. And both were against the Catholic plots to restore England to papal obedience. Period. James underrated, so King James I, underrated the intensity of these hatreds. He dreamed of an entente demi cordiale between Puritans and Anglicans, and for that purpose, he called a he called their leaders to a conference at Hampton Court in January 1604. He it says here he presided like Constantine and astonished both parties with his theological learning and his debating skills. But he insisted on one doctrine and one discipline, one religion in substance and ceremony, and declared episcopacy indispensable. But uh, it says nothing came of the conference except the unexpectedly historic decision to make a new translation of the Bible. And this would be called... This would be called the King James Version of the Bible, 1604. And then James, um, he disgraced himself by having two Unitarians burned for doubting the divinity of Christ. So there was intermittently some um, resolution between, some compromise at least, between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church and um, there's a little bit of peace after enough people had died in massacres, but not Catesby. And Catesby had a vendetta to settle. Some Catholic dissidents, however, sought to overthrow Protestant rule in England. King James's adherence to the 1559 settlement and public continuance of intolerant policies inspired some to take a more active role to place a Catholic monarch on the throne. So it's a tension. It's, um, King James was a little ostentatious, a little obvious in his proclamation of wanting to be, he was so well learned. And I guess that's the proverbial 
devil coming out in them. The devil is always the one that's too enamored of their own intelligence, and they believe that they don't have to. They don't have to bow to any outside authority if they understand divinity enough within them. They don't believe. They uh, they're often marked by lacking humility, and maybe that's what James's fault ultimately was. I mean, granted, he was a a king, and he had to deal with wars and people's lives, literally depending on his decisions all the time. So I don't think many of us could uh, could picture having such a heavy burden, you know, heavy as the crown sort of thing, as Jack Nicholson said. Let me, let me open this book. I, I threw it down, I threw it down in aggravation, but I do think uh, King James's actions will be put into context a little bit better. For the most part, James was a tolerant dogmatist. He offended the Puritans by permitting in, permitting and even encouraging Sunday sports. So Sunday sports goes a long way back, huh? Provided one had first attended Anglican services. He was inclined to relax the laws against Catholics over the heads of Robert Cecil and the council, he suspended the recessancy laws. He allowed priests to enter the country and say mass in private homes, not public churches. He dreamed in his loose and philosophical way of reconciling Catholic and Protestant Christendom. But when Catholics multiplied in this sunshine and the Puritans denounced his lenience, he allowed the Elizabethan anti-Catholic laws to be renewed and even extended and enforced in 1604 to send anyone abroad to a Catholic college was made punishable by a fine of 100 pounds um, I think that's pretty much like saying $100,000 nowadays persons neglecting Anglican services were fined 20 pounds per month any default in paying such fines involved forfeiture of property, including cattle on delinquent's lands, all his furniture, and wearing apparel, or to be seized by the crown. So, you know, he, I guess he made the mistake of trying to be too lenient. And, um, and then retracting his leniency, overcompensating, and gaining enemies by the people he oppressed. And Catesby, so this is about Guy Fox, but you don't know Guy Fox unless he was recruited by Catesby. Some Catholic dissidents sought to overthrow King James. One such person was Catesby, the son of a gentry Catholic family from the English Midlands, so he was from wealth. Although less famous than Guy Fawkes today, he was, in fact, the character charismatic and persuasive Catesby who organized what later became the Gunpowder Plot in his early 30s when he conceived the plot. Catesby had a strong, attractive personality. A Victorian historian declared he's said to have exercised magical influence on all who mixed with him. He used his charisma to sell the belief that only extreme, spectacular violence would end the persecution suffered by the English Catholics. The idea of using gunpowder had occurred to him in 1603, and Catesby began began recruiting in early 1604 the plan to blow up Parliament and King James I in the hopes that a Catholic rule could be restored in the aftermath. So 
So the plot's first members belong to the disaffected Catholic gentry. Thomas Winter, John Wright, and Thomas Percy. They were all in their 30s, maybe young 40s. Um, Thomas Winter traveled to Flanders, which was under Spanish rule at the time, to seek out Spanish assistance. Spanish being ruled by Catholics. But Spain wasn't interested. Luckily, Winter found someone who was. Guy Fox. Guy Fox a former schoolmate of Wright, um, going by the name Guido at the time. The English fox was fighting for the Spanish in Flanders, born a Protestant in York in 1570. Fox later converted to c Catholicism. Intelligent, tough, and cool-headed, his qualities were noted by English Catholics. Winter learned of Fox's extensive exper expertise in explosives and convinced him to join the plot. In May 1604, at the Duck and Drake Inn in London, the five men met and swore an oath of loyalty. Scholars have wondered just what the impact of the gunpowder plot would have been, actually, if they had been able to explode it. The Center for Explosion Studies at the University of Aberystwyth in Wales, sought to find out. If Fox had been able to ignite the barrels, there would have been total destruction within a 40-yard radius. Walls and roofs destroyed at 100 yards, and windows broken as far as 900 yards away. <laughs> the Houses of Parliament in Westminster Abbey would have been completely destroyed, while structures in Whitehall about a third of a mile away would have been damaged as well. Catesby's explosive attack on, Eng on the English crown took shape in the months that followed. Percy began living in a house close to Parliament with Fox, by then adopting, adopting his pseudonym John Johnson, <laughs> posed as his servant. So that must have been, maybe that was common. I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt there, hoping, assuming he was put on the spot when he got discovered and that's all he could think of but uh, nope John Johnson was what he arrived at six months beforehand so the plotters began acquiring gunpowder and the conspiracy later grew to include members who provided funds and further resources they were Robert Keyes Robert Winter John Grant Christopher Wright and the servant Thomas Bates in March 1605, Percy rented a basement storeroom at the Palace of Westminster. The gunpowder was then transported directly there, where under the expert supervision of Fox, it could do the most damage. Three wealthy, influential men, Ambrose Rookwood, Francis Tresham, and Sir Everard Digby, joined the conspiracy, bringing the total number to 13. Should have added one more. Several times they planned to launch the attack when Parliament opened, but delays forced them to wait. Finally, in November 1605, it appeared that the plan would finally be set in motion. It's remarkable that with a total of 13 plotters, the conspiracy stayed secret until Lord Monteagle received his letter. Scholars have long puzzled over the identity of the sender. One candidate is Monteagle's own brother-in-law, Francis Treshman, one of Catesby's co-conspirators, but no conclusive proof is found. But in any case, once Monteagle handed over the letter, the search was ordered and Fox was arrested and brought to the Tower of London in the early hours of November 5th. So Fox was able to resist interrogation, that is, until King James ordered torture on November 6th, 1605, who only then relented and confessed. By then, many of the conspirators had fled, but the king's forces moved swiftly to hunt them down. 
Catesby Percy and Christopher Wright were killed in a shootout in Staffordshire, Northern England, with James I's soldiers. Catesby's death spared him from the grisly punishments meted out to traitors, but also denied historians of his version of punishments. Sorry, I misread that. His versions of how the conspiracy unfolded, how the idea of blowing up Parliament came to him, as well as the way in which he recruited his team of conspirators. The rest were caught, taken back to London, and convicted of treason, except for Francis Tresham, who died in prison before his trial. All who were tried were sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Hmm. And um, just because I know you guys are not going to be able to sleep until you know what hang, drawn, and quartered means. Well, you know what hanged means. It was from a 1352 statutory penalty in England for men convicted of high treason under Henry III. A convicted traitor was fastened to a hurdle, or wooden panel, and drawn by a horse to the place of execution, which, um, along rough terrain, even on asphalt, even if it was paved, it would still rip, rip the bark off pretty good drawn by horse to place of execution where he was then hanged almost to the point of death almost and he was emasculated I'll let you imagine what that means disemboweled beheaded and quartered which means chopped into four pieces the traitor's remains were often displayed in prominent places across the country such as the London Bridge. For reasons of public decency, women convicted of high treason were instead burned at the stake. Hmm. I think we've come a long way since then. Fox and the others were set for execution in January 1606. James is described, he's quoted as saying, these wretches who thought to have blown up the whole world of this island. Fox was able to escape his full sentence, though. On the day of execution, he jumped from the gallows, breaking his own neck in the fall. Smart guy. Nonetheless, his corpse was quartered and sent to the four corners of the kingdom. The other men received the full measure of their sentences as warning to other potential rebels. King James's reaction was remarkably circumspect. He was anxious to avoid both a pogrom against the Catholic subjects and diplomatic tensions with Catholic states. His speech to Parliament and official sermons preached by leading churchmen stressed the heinousness of the plot, but also accepted that many English Catholics were still loyal subjects. The miraculous nature of the plot's discovery proved an important propaganda tool, you can imagine, how competent he claimed his court was in order to be able to figure out that plot. There's a very important propaganda tool. Even before the executions of the plotters, Parliament passed the Thanksgiving Act of 1606, requiring every parish church in England to deliver a sermon on November 5th, thanking God for the deliverance from the Catholic plot. Over time, the day of Thanksgiving, it morphed into Guy Fawkes Day, called uh, Bonfire Night throughout the UK. Every November 5th, fireworks 
representing gunpowder, and bonfires mark the occasion with straw effigies of fox called guys being burned. Despite not being the ringleader of the conspiracy, Fox became the face of it and was elevated to lasting fame.